All right, so welcome to 24 Hours of UX. I'm Nathalie Rococa from Whitespace. Um, I live in Australia, it's nine o'clock here. And um, I'm, I'm very glad to be hosting this session uh, today. If it's your first time uh, uh, joining uh, this conference, uh, well, you probably heard that it's a community-based conference bringing 24 hours continuous discussion exchanges on uh, the topic of user experience uh, from uh, everywhere in, in the globe. So we, why are we doing this? Well, we really value uh, local you know, communities of UX practitioners and uh, we feel like uh, it's, a, it's a great way to exchange on best practice and cultural, cultural practice uh, around UX. We are now in our 19th hour of the conference. There is another five hours of fun after this one. So nine talks divided in two, two tracks, UX in practice and elevating UX. There's one more keynote and one more workshop after this one. Let me introduce you to the panel here. Uh, Paul Mike Inerni, a UX researcher from CIBC. Ilona Posner, UX consultant and lecturer at the University of Toronto. Andrew Chack, head of experience design at Wattpad. And Drew Ellis, enterprise product designer at Acosta. Welcome. And um, so the title of the session today is uh, Toshi, the cure for the common Zoom. Tips and tricks from a year of working remotely as a head of experience design. Um, so uh, just a couple of um, uh, instructions on how to use AirMeet if uh, you don't know yet. Uh, you welcome to use the emoji to express your sentiment and emotions during the talk. So you have the emoji button at the bottom of uh, the interface. You're welcome to use the chat as well if you haven't done so. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tab and uh, we will make sure they will be answered. And if you um, want to turn on your subtitle, just press on the CC button at the bottom of the uh, interface, the closed caption. Um, I'm just going to hand over to the group. So Paul, that's uh, your turn. And I'm going to hide away and come back five minutes before the end of the discussion. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome everyone. Welcome from Toronto, Canada and from Torquay. Torquay is very happy to be part of the 24 hours of UX. Uh, what we've uh, planned for our session is uh, we've, uh, we've got some highlights. Did we lose Paul? Our, what's that? Uh, I've got uh, some highlights from uh, a couple of our recent speakers. We've uh, they've uh, uh, agreed to come and give you uh, our bridge version of uh, Well, I think talks. that we might have lost uh... Paul and his, his connection. So I, think I can I hear him. You can hear him. I can, I can hear him fine. Oh, I can't hear him. <laughs> okay. No. We can okay. hear him. Okay. Fix your side. Okay. Mm. Testing, right. testing, testing. No, uh, you're good. So, go ahead. Yeah. Keep going. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, welcome from Torquay. We've got a couple of speakers that to give us some highlights of uh, some recent talks they gave to Torquay. And we'll end our session with a little mini panel to tell you a bit more about our organization and how we've managed to stay uh, around for many, many years. So I'll turn it over to our first speaker, who's Andrew Chack. Thank you, Andrew. Can you hear me, Andrew? Could someone, now can someone tell Andrew frozen? he's on? No, he Am can't hear me, though. No, Natalie? Me? Yes, now he's on. Can, Good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you are. I'm here. Uh, my name is Andrew Chack. I'm here from Toronto, Canada. And um, I get to share with you a, a talk here about the cure for the common Zoom. And uh, to start, I'm going to pop over a link in the chat. Uh, there's a URL that you can go to, which is ahaslides.com slash 24 cure zoom. Um, and you can, uh, it's probably best for you to access that through your phone or a secondary device. And this will allow you to participate in today's session. 
Um, and it's really about, we know that we're going to be having remote uh, work for uh, a while now. Uh, it's something that we're gonna, it's gonna be part of our new normal. It is a part of our new normal. And how can we make that better? And how can we maximize the value of the interactions that we have with one another through remote work, through video conferencing. And when I say Zoom, I really mean uh, video conferencing uh, overall. So please join uh, the URL. Um, you can take your phone and scan this QR code to uh, join um, these slides. And what will happen is that you'll see the slides progress your phone um, or your, your other device, and there will be an interactive portion on here for you to provide your input and pull and provide input as we go along. So uh, let's kind of uh, get into it. I do want to encourage you to uh, pop over any questions uh, into the chat. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Alona and, and Paul to kind of pause me in case there are any questions that uh, come up that should be addressed uh, as we go along, as I'm not able to see uh, the, the questions as I'm kind of full on into presentation. Uh, mode uh, over here. So please do uh, just flag me if uh, if there's something pressing that we need to address. Can you, so, Andrew, can you show the QR code again, please? Yeah, sure. There you go. Or you can go to ahaslides.com slash 24 cure zoom. All right. All right. So I see a bunch of people that have joined that, which is great. Okay. So I got to start. I want to ask you, uh, and you'll see this prompt on your phone. It says, "What? Use one word to describe how you are feeling right now." Uh, as Natalie said at the uh, top of the hour, this is like hour 19 within 24 hours of uh, UX, and um, and maybe it's it's probably a different time zone uh, in in your in your world. So, so I love that word: wistful, good, scattered, tired, hungry, excited, uh, fresh. Um, you know, for some of us, this may be a, a, quite a long day, or it's the end of the day for you, or it's the, the beginning. All right, so thank you for, for, for sharing that. Now, I want you to think about, uh, let's say you've been invited to a three-hour Zoom meeting. How do you feel about attending? What kind of thoughts come to mind when you're like, oh boy, here we go. We've got a three-hour uh, Zoom meeting coming up. Uh, how does that make you feel? What, yeah, ick. Um, what else? What else kind of comes to mind when you've been invited to like this marathon of a three hour Zoom meeting? Oof. Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. Bring snacks. Actually, I heard, uh, you know, one facilitator, uh, you know, really guiding people. It's like, okay, it's part of the agenda and your preparation. Of, bring your water, bring your snacks. Uh, but it is something that could be quite uh, annoying, boring, uh, dread, an energy drainer. Um, hope it's fun. I hope today is is fun for you so that we're not your normal Zoom or air meet uh, meeting. Yeah, there's a decision point as to whether or not we should have camera on or off. What's going to be the protocol? What are the expectations uh, for us in how we might participate in it? So there's a lot of mixed feelings at yet another meeting, another video call to uh, participate in or have to be a part of. I mean, I've heard of some managers where they're like insistent on like these marathon long meetings and it's kind of like their way of supervising people which is awful and um and so some interesting comments here about like whether or not we can keep our camera uh, on or off um, and those are critical questions to work through as to how we facilitate a zoom meeting so the issue is is that there is a thing called zoom fatigue it's real and what's important is for us to understand what are the culprits of Zoom fatigue? What causes the Zoom fatigue? Why are we so tired when it comes to, Zoom, uh, to a Zoom meeting or a video call? What makes us dread them? Well, culprit number one is stationary head syndrome. See, this is me staring into a Zoom meeting. And the thing that's unnatural about a Zoom meeting or video conferences is that our heads are stationary. We are um, pretty much looking at the screen for hours on end. And it's different than what we do when we are in a meeting. In a meeting, at least if I'm talking to different people, I'm looking in different ways, I'm shifting my position, I have more freedom to be able to move around. 
Whereas in a Zoom meeting, we tend to be very fixated in one static position. And that in of itself is very fatiguing. So healthcare tip number one is you gotta do your stretches. You've got to find ways to uh, be mobile and to have motion and to stretch yourself. Whether you're doing uh, shoulder shrugs or neck to neck uh, rolls, or you're gonna turn your head from side to side or raise your head up and down, it's important that you take care. So if you had any of those words where you were dread kind of tired um, uh, and it's been a long day for you, you got to do your stretches. And we're going to do some right now because we're going to practice this self-care. And I'm going to spin this little wheel here on AHA slides to see, well, what kind of stretch should we do as a group? You don't all have to turn your cameras on to do this uh, stretch together. But OK, so let's do some shoulder. Let's do some shoulder shrugs, right? So you're going to go up and you're going to go down. You're going to go up and then you're going to go down. Up and down. Up and down. One more. Up and down. Right? We're going to get some motion, get some fl blood flowing. One of my designers in one of our facilitation sessions, uh, actually in our design critique, which we call a design playground, uh, she led us in a stretching exercise during one of our critique sessions as a way of opening it up. And we were just like so relieved. It was a a breath of fresh air to get us woken up and engaged in the session. So do your stretches and uh, get some blood flowing to mentally, physically prepare yourself for it. The second culprit is selfie consciousness. And uh, a strange thing happens when we are on a Zoom call and we have video on, and especially when we see a video of ourselves, we tend to look at ourselves. It's very much like looking in the mirror. And it's a big distraction and it's actually quite fatiguing. So self-care tip number two is that when you are in a Zoom call, you can do this in Google Meet and other platforms as well, is to hide your self view. Um, you know, when I have my video on, uh, I, I like to turn my self uh, camera view off so that I don't get fussed about, is my head centered in the right place? Um, you know, what's happening in, 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 in the background? Uh, and I'm not just preoccupied with how I look. And I can focus more on the content. I can focus more uh, on engaging the, uh, the audience. Culprit number three is bug-eyed attention. Uh, there's something very interesting about uh, the presence of other people within Zoom, uh, within a video conference meeting. Now, I'm going to show you an example of something. And there's a trigger warning over here. And it's all about. Uh, spider eyes. I'm going to show you a close-up image of a spider. Some of you might not like this image. It might freak you out a little bit. So I'm giving you a bit of a warning that this image is coming up. And here we go. Spider eyes. And when I see this, I get kind of creeped out. Um, I, I really don't like this, you know, this type of this type of image. And uh, the interesting thing is, is that there's something within Zoom that kind of looks like this called the gallery view. And it can feel quite intimidating to have all of these eyes staring in, uh, in on you. So the self-care tip over there is minimize that view, shrink that view or shrink that gallery, or you might even put some distance between yourself and your laptop or your computer or your screen in order to minimize that sense of all eyes uh, on you. The fourth culprit for Zoom fatigue is uh, allowing for distraction. And that's where we may be having our phones or other devices that are uh, distracting us or another tab or something else that is distracting you from being fully in. And it's kind of like being in a movie theater and still texting on your phone. And what we lose here is we lose immersion. We lose the ability to focus in and be captivated by whatever the meeting is being presented. When I'm watching a movie at home, I really have to like put my phone away so that I don't get tempted to like look into my phone and I'm losing my focus in on the meeting. So it's just uh, on, on, on what's being presented. So it's the same thing in a meeting. We need to make sure that we are focused on, um, on, on the content, on the meeting itself, and that we're not distracted by looking at a phone. So we either need to remove our distractions um, or if you are finding that you're very strongly tempted to not pay full attention to the meeting, Maybe there's something wrong with the meeting in of itself or where engagement is going to be and you need to negotiate your release. So maybe it's like you, you ask for a, uh, a release via doing something asynchronously or somehow other, some other way of participating in the session because it's not a priority uh, for you. 
But otherwise, it is important that we remove those distractions from us so that we can focus. So over to you. What's your self-care tip for Zoom meetings? How do you make, you know, when you go in as an attendee, um, what helps yourself uh, in terms of making sure that you stay focused in the meeting, that you're able to be your full self uh, in there? What's your self-care tip? I would love to hear from you all uh, in terms of you know, your a cup of tea. Yep, being well hydrated is, uh, is important. Anyway, uh, changing to a standing uh, desk. I often like switch up and down between standing and sitting. Quitting Slack is excellent. Um, I actually, there are days and afternoons where I will turn off uh, Slack. I actually find Slack a huge distraction in terms of getting into flow, um, not scheduling the Zoom meetings back to back. Um, and yes, we are also gonna be talking about UX roadmaps. I just take up the first kind of uh, 20 minutes of this. Um, and then it'll be over to Drew for the UX roadmaps. Taking a break, uh, bathroom uh, breaks, tea and stretches, a lot of sunlight. Uh, taking notes is actually a great way of uh, staying engaged within the session. Great tips. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to the other side, which is about facilitating healthy meetings. And uh, I wanna ask you all, uh, what is a frustrating phrase that you're likely to hear during a Zoom meeting? There's a lot of cliches that we often hear uh, in a call. Yeah, camera's on, uh, you're on mute, uh, happens all the time. Uh, what other frustrating phrases come to mind? I can't share, uh, I can't hear you. Um, uh, there's other phrases like that. Oh, okay, you go first, oh, no, oh, you go first. Uh, I hope you don't mind if we extend for another 30 minutes. My Wi-Fi is dropping, you're frozen. Uh, we even had this day, my internet is not working. Uh, let's give her a few minutes in 30 minutes. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of challenges and like new protocols that we didn't need to navigate when we're using Zoom. So some tips as a facilitator. Uh, tip number one is greet people by name. Welcome people, just like Alona did uh, at, the, at the top of the hour as people were joining in the session. And it's good because that's, it's good manners. It kind of mimics like just a good welcoming meeting session. But the key thing about uh, greeting people by name and acknowledging them is that it primes them for participation and it re reduces the bystander effect. It gives people a sense of, oh, I'm recognized, I'm acknowledged, I'm more ready to engage in the session. Zoom tip number two is to break the participation ice. And we need to kind of have progressive participation. So at the top of this session, we started with a very simple to answer question. How are you feeling? Describe it in one word. And then we get more complex in the ask, but we want to prime people for that participation, give them an easy way to participate up front and, uh, and engage them in participating more deeply. You can even do things where you stage the participation. Like let's say I want to give people room and space to ideate. And uh, if some people are more shy in presenting things on screen, I might ask them, okay, write down a bunch of ideas on, on, in your own notepad. Okay, now take a look at those ideas and write them out within the sticky notes on our whiteboard or within our chat. So that's a progressive participation type of principle being leveraged over there. And what's really important is uh, beyond icebreakers is that we build connections with people and building, uh, knowing people beyond the screen is uh, really important. I'll share one particular resource that I think is pretty cool. It's called Slides with Friends. Uh, or slideswith.com, and it's a bunch of templates of icebreaker kind of slides and presentations that you can go through as team building exercises to get to know people beyond the screen. And that's something that you can do to build trust outside of say a regular uh, or a dedicated uh, you know, business oriented meeting. It's one in which you're building working relationships and trust. Zoom tip number three is to be inclusive of chat and nonverbal. We want to enable people to participate through text. Uh, not everyone enjoys being in the spotlight of speaking. Some express themselves better through written form, and it also enables parallel participation. Now I have a question for you. It's like, you know, as you optimize for, you know, your web view, what is something that you've intentionally worked to hide from your webcam view? Uh, maybe you turn webcam off together because of this, or it's like, you know, you're framing the way that you are setting up the view of your uh, of your camera on your on your laptop 
right? Oh yes, mirrors is 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 very good, right? Like is my backside being exposed? Uh, eating my kids, uh, personal items like clothing. I'm in my son's bedroom uh, right now. If I bend the camera down, you will see his pile of clothes. Uh, bad hair, yeah. I mean, I I live in 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 Toronto, Canada, and we've had no hair salons for for many months now. So a lot of us have bad hair. Um, you know, bad hair months. Our, our mayor is actually being mocked for having quite the long set of locks. Um, yeah, and like your entire room. So, you know, we work to kind of, uh, kind of curate this view within with our camera. And that's, that's kind of work, it's effort. So tip number four is for us as facilitators is that we need to be inclusive of no video. Oftentimes, we think going into a session that we have to have people turn video on and we need to think differently about being inclusive of people of no video. So some may be self-conscious of their at-home workspace. Many of us are having bad hair days. And it, if we you know, welcome people to participate with their video off, it helps them to channel their energy on participation rather than worrying about appearances. And then my final tip, Zoom tip number five, is to incorporate shared participation. And this is about having a common workspace for people to publicly see what is being contributed to. And you can use Google Docs, uh, Slides, Miro, Miro, tools like AHA Slides, or even chat. And this is a must for maintaining engagement and focus. And the other key thing that we would have that's really important in terms of facilitating participation is to enable open-ended response CES convergence. And what I mean by that is that it's, it's very uh, risky to go into a meeting and say, hey, does everyone agree that we should do X? And if I say X, the assumption is that we all have a shared understanding as to what X means. And so it's important. Instead, we say, hey, we are thinking about doing X. Then ask people, everyone, please try to respond as, what does that mean to you? What do you think it means when we're doing Project X? Define it. And that way you'll see if you have a, a convergence or a divergence in terms of an understanding of that. The same thing goes for our process. Let's do things this way. I want to improve how we collaborate, right? Then the question is, well, what does that look like to you? What, do, what does that improvement in collaboration look like to you and have people express it in concrete terms? And it's important that we understand if we have a divergence in our understanding and by asking open-ended questions and people's interpretation of things, we have a better idea as to whether or not we have true convergence or not. So uh, I'm gonna wrap things up uh, here today as, uh, as we are tight uh, on time. Um, and I'll ask you, you know, based on today's session, what is one thing that you'll now do differently when it comes to Zoom? What's a, a tip that you'll, you'll take away or approach, or maybe it's tips that you saw from other people uh, here today. Um, yeah, enabling participation, that's great. That's a very good mechanic. Uh, feeling less guilty if I turn your, your camera off, absolutely. Greeting and welcoming people is important. It adds a human element. Yeah, and do the exercises together. We, my designer that led that session, she was like worried about how that might come off, but people were just so relieved. It was actually the highlight of our week. You know, highlights of the week are different nowadays in a pandemic. Um, but having that human connection, doing something together and facilitating participation are great ways of um, curing the common Zoom. And so thank you. Uh, please uh, connect with me on a LinkedIn and I will uh, hang around for any other questions. Good. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. I don't see any questions in the, uh, the Q&A uh, list here, but if somebody quickly puts in a question, we can take it. But um, you know, in the meantime, uh, thanks very much for sharing your right. useful and timely we'll tips. Transition over to Drew for his portion. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me, Drew? Thumbs up. Yep, yeah. you're all good. Hi, right, folks. Good. How are you? All right, over to you. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Thanks for being online uh, after such a long day. I actually started in uh, really early my time and got some viewing in at. Uh, 7 a.m. So this has kind of been a 12 hour uh, slog in and out, but it's been a really good one. It's my first participation in uh, 24 hours of UX. It's a fantastic uh, uh, exercise so far, and I've learned a lot already uh, from some of the other presenters. So hopefully that will be a trend that we continue here in Toronto tonight. 
Um, I know some of you are uh, looking forward to joining uh, uh, some of the uh, Canadian Championships on hockey right now. Uh, we're happy to have a team still in the championships. Uh, so uh, we're pleasure to have you here um, instead of there, but we'll do our best to entertain you either way. Um, I want to, uh, uh, I'll do the share here now just so we get things rolling. Um, this actually started out, I'm a, a fairly long time member of, uh, of Torquay uh, in Toronto. I think I've probably uh, been a member now for around 15 years on and off or so, I think on and off. My membership dues might've been a little behind there, here and there. <clears throat> uh, but anyways, um, one of the great things about Torquay is it is a great forum in Toronto, which is a hotbed for product development uh, for showcasing uh, UX design and product design and things of great interest and great spectrum. And uh, one of the things, uh, after many, many years of being a member, I volunteered to give uh, one of the case studies that I was developing for my portfolio. So this is actually, um, you know, when I reduced this conversation that I originally gave at Torquay down to this presentation here tonight, uh, this is more of a uh, sharing of insights and, uh, and uh, my story and my journey as expressed through the roadmap and kind of what I've learned uh, coming through this. The original how-to, not for the faint of heart, um, literally showed a lot of my thinking uh, straight out of the box. So uh, without further ado, I think the only question that I really wanted to uh, answer beyond sort of delving into some of the terms, what is a UX roadmap? I know that's, you know, roadmaps are a common term in the product design space, but UX roadmaps, I think, are a term that's starting to come into their own. And uh, ultimately, you know, my question was, do I need to meme or not to meme in this presentation? I, I want to make sure that not only am I attending to my terminology here properly, but I know I have an international audience. I know I have an audience that's prone to looking over at their phone every once in a while. So for those that can only peek in uh, occasionally, I've decided to opt for the meme accompanied presentment here of my story. And I hope you will enjoy that uh, as we go. Um, roadmaps, uh, let's let's talk about the, uh, the term UX, first of all. Uh, Featuring some of the quotes from my memes from my favorite movies, uh, UX, uh, that term has been something that we as an as a industry have struggled with for many, many years uh, that I have been part of it. Um, but one of the defining moments for me uh, way back in the day was reading a book called The Experience Economy. This is around uh, 2000. And it defined that, uh, that essence of what experience design was. And the idea that, you know, with, with that term economy, that you could derive value from designing an experience. And that always fascinated me because not only did I love an, a great experience, and not only was I in the early web design days and product design days where I was trying to make things better and, and trying to make things into an experience, what was really new to me at the time was how experience could be turned into something of financial value. And therefore, something that the business partners that we design for want to pay attention to. So UX for me, at least in my career, has been devoting my skill set to developing the basic skills of experience design or user experience design. And there's the, the, the six or seven pillars that we all know and love. But the real seat at the strategy table in organizations that I've been part of was brought to me by the idea that I could understand and express design in an economic return on investment. And uh, that was one of the things that... Um, you know, when we talk about UX design, we do, we always talk about the users, we talk about trying to understand their problems, but being able to set their problems into a framework that business can sell and that business understands how to uh, operationalize and to monetize is a real uh, feather in your cap when you are trying to take your UX design skill set and influence upwards in the organization or influence at a peer level. Uh, with some uh, high-powered stakeholders in your organization. Uh, the other uh, term here that I think we really need to talk about here is roadmaps itself. Uh, roadmaps has a lot of different uh, connotations. Uh, there's roadmaps just in terms of, you know, how it, it relates to just going down the road. And you can see this beautiful graphic I, I chose as the background from my original presentation really points to the true idea of what roadmaps are all about. They point us towards the North Star of what we are trying to build. They are showing us the way that we are going to get to that valuable destination, which we're all striving for. And I guess, you know, one of the memes that really stood out for me here was 
that age old, and you, you guys have probably seen this, uh, you know, many times in your uh, in your travels online. Um, you know, it's the difference between doing experience design and actually watch, watching what users do and how that maps to design. Notice that both of those pathways, by the way, go to the same place. It's just, how are you going to get there? Are you going to build a lot of features in between that you think users should need? Or are you going to watch users and get informed by that? And more importantly, understand why and understand the, uh, the value around that and, and orient your North Star towards that value rather than maybe the, the requirements that gave you that initial design. So that's what roadmaps uh, you know, really started to mean to me. And I think the first time I really heard about this in my career was back a couple of jobs ago when I was asked to develop by the, uh, by the, uh, the, product, the senior product manager at the time, uh, what's my UX roadmap for our product? And I have to say, I, I kind of blinked and said, well, isn't that your job as the, as the product manager? And uh, you know, sure enough, uh, that term and, and uh, my understanding of it sort of started a whole new spin on my career and a whole new focus on product design, which uh, you know, still persists to this day. Um, one of the things that uh, I think uh, I'm a lone designer, I've been a lone designer in many enterprise organizations. Acosta is no different. It is an extremely large organization, a multinational global organization. It has many acquired components to it that are different aspects of its business. And overall, we connect brands to uh, the customers that love them. We are uh, merchandisers. We try to get brands into the hands of people. Uh, either through shelves or through in-store demonstrations or through uh, education programs and things like that. But all of this is an integrated service. And, and when I was hired, uh, lo and behold, I didn't really know the organization initially that I was getting into. It was one of these big enterprises with a very, very small product department in the merchandising uh, uh, realm of the IT group. And so you can see right away when I begin to describe it that way, and when you see this, um, maybe you're identifying a little bit with some of the design jobs you've had. And I, I, I kind of like to think that I'm not alone in this space. I call myself an enterprise designer because sometimes designers get buried in all this complexity. But I rather suspect that a lot of designers have this or will have this in their career. And it's really important to know, uh, you know how to develop a product strategy when you're dealing with the fact that you're there. And not only are you trying to bring your UX design knowledge to that organization, you're also drinking from the fire hose of everything that they bring to the table and that you have to accommodate your designs. So uh, this was a really important sort of lesson for me is to understand uh, my place and understand how that uh, contributes to where I'm going. Uh, just a little bit about our users. Um, they're the people that work in the stores. So we design uh, field tools for uh, these reps to go into stores and it allows them to plan their visit and their coverage of the stores in their territory. It allows them to record uh, their actions on certain tasks that they need to do, uh, building a display, uh, uh, putting new product price updates on the shelves, uh, uh, putting new inventory on the shelves when there's uh, um, an outage and that sort of thing. And a lot of this software is driven by data-led analytics and um, forecasts and some artificial intelligence that drives what these reps should be looking at and what priority. So there's a real connection between what they see and the things that they need to do in what order to the bottom line of how we make money. And so from a design point of view, uh, you know, especially in the enterprise space, it's interesting to sort of take note of the difference between a product, not so much a consumer product, but one that may uh, you know, be in the hands of a captive audience like ours. This is an internal sales force that we have and that we maintain at Acosta. Uh, and we use and we uh, deploy the sales force with our tools uh, to our clients uh, benefit at all these different stores. So. Uh, this is the problem I think sometimes is this is a very large organization, but it really illustrates, you know, this meme and uh, one of my favorite movies uh, really, really well. Uh, you can't simply define or design a user experience when you are in a company like this without the uh, aid of what I would call a UX roadmap. And that is part of what I want to talk to you about today. And hopefully what you will see along the route here uh, are a couple of highlighted waypoints. So every time you see this sort of visual language or most every time, uh, hopefully I've done my homework, um, what I'm trying to communicate here is an important sort of insight or a lesson that I'll sort of spend some time talking about and we can discuss this a little bit further. But first and foremost, I think when you join a company like this, when you have a tool that uh, you know is used in this certain configuration, 
you are part of a larger service design, and that tool is a very small part. But in our particular orientation, our tool is the tip of the spear that gathers all of the data that all of our clients want to see and that our reps are measured on in terms of the performance. So when, as a designer, I wanted to know what our North Star was, not only could I rely on our corporate North Star and what our service design sought, sought to do, but I'm also trying to understand how our product fits into that ecosystem and how it delivers value. And uh, I spent some time in the in the other presentation talking a little bit about how we drew those lines and connected those dots uh, to to derive value when really all we had was the corporate North Star to go on. Um, we had to kind of derive these principles. Um, we didn't really have a roadmap, an actual product roadmap that showed any priority with which we were building features. And so part of our exercise uh, initially to make sure that roadmaps and UX roadmaps were considered uh, were to, to create this conversation with the product team, with the engineering team about what our product actually does and how that connects to value. And as soon as we have that, as soon as we can measure that, we have a really engaging way to uh, make money. And that's exactly what I think this, uh, one of my absolute favorite movies is really trying to tell you here. Uh, what if I told you there was another reality here? What if those design principles weren't just lofty things that we wanted to promise the user on a sunny day scenario sometime, but what if that was something that I could actually communicate with my product teams and say, look, if we do X or X or Y, we can move the needle incrementally towards more value, more return, more engagement, more efficiency, whatever the metrics are. And those have those will those will be the stories that the stakeholders above you and beyond your product team want to hear. Those are the principles that set the stage for what it is that you're going to do in your roadmap. Now, I mentioned there was one aspect of this. There's uh, another aspect too. And uh, in all of the years in my UX design career, I have never had an occasion where I have not had to explain to everybody that would want to listen what my process is and where I fit in that process. And especially in enterprise organizations with multiple uh, stakeholders from different divisions, this is incredibly important to create visual artifacts uh, such as this that allow you to communicate what you mean by, I do lean UX or I do discovery, or I want to do some research in the discovery phase. All of these terms are things that really need to be communicated over an artifact like this. And I want to make sure that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead there. I want to make sure that uh, once we get rid of this, that, that typically this, uh, this um, timeline of, of UX design is the one that I've been sort of spending my career trying to attain. Um, largely, when you when you come into a company as a UX designer, you are uh, obligated to sort of show and lead your craft and and be hands on in your design. And uh, oftentimes in the enterprise, you are that lone designer, and that means you are on a sprint team. You are running agile with the team. You often take things that are relatively designed um, or or relatively well thought out and refine them a little bit more and deliver them. And that kind of represents. A lot of the places where people initially play in their career in UX design and a place where as you start to want to own and participate more in the strategy and the direction, you want to actually encourage people to play more in this area. And that's exactly what we did with uh, creating a new discovery uh, line of investigation that goes through and uses journey mapping and experience visioning here. And this uh, diagram allows us to literally uh, show that and, and converse with product teams and uh, these various other tracks, development, product management, and existing research channels about the things that we're trying to do. Now, I'm getting a beeping sound here, so I just wanna make sure I'm not ignoring some prompt here, but uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, we're all good here, so let me go back. Um, so this, is, um, this was a, a complex diagram to actually not only build and articulate, but um, as you can see by some of the terminology, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we've lost your slides. Oh, okay. Let me try that again. I understand from earlier in the uh, in the day, there's been a, a bit of a wandering glitch with that. So my apologies on that. Okay, you should be able to see that now. Is that right? All right. I'm going to assume that's okay, unless uh, Paul, you can be nice. Right. 
Um, one of the important things here was not only to identify where we wanted to change process and introduce new research where none existed before. We wanted to actually do some of these journey mapping uh, discovery sessions and uh, pioneer some different techniques of research where none existed. This diagram was instrumental in being able to convince stakeholders that it was necessary and where we would play with all the different others that we needed to talk to and how that timeline of development corresponded literally with some of the ways that we would tag our uh, stories in JIRA, how we would move our, our feature development along in our production system once we had defined it from a concept. So uh, once again, I, I can't stress enough how process and the use of visual art artifacts um, in addition to those design principles are two of the really important tools to help you articulate where you want to go um, as part of UX roadmap, right? Now, um, I I'm gonna kind of hold questions. Normally I would kind of uh, um, seek some questions as we go, but I'm gonna hold them a little bit later because I'm kind of on a tempo here to show you a little bit around and, and end with about 15 minutes here. So we can have maybe five minutes at the end. Um, we use journey maps here, and I think uh, for those of you that have used journey maps before, um, you know, there's a very, um, uh, there's a lot of different approaches for them. Uh, generally speaking, they have swim lanes, which represent different user personas. You can see the three of the personas that we, uh, in, in our line of business, talk about here primarily are field reps and their interaction with their managers. Uh, this journey map is really great at being able to, uh, we introduced this in our client sessions where we listen to what the, the client requirements were to onboard onto our tool. We, uh, in the second session, showed this journey map to them, which articulated what we heard and allowed us to create conversation points around some of the details. And some of those details are wrapped up in some of these, uh, you know, process boxes that you see uh, in, in the flow here. And those process boxes can be defined to whatever level of detail you want to go with your clients and with your research, uh, with your users to understand what their journey is. In our case, we wanted to get a very high level understanding of what our journey was, because primarily what we were trying to understand here is uh, since, since that journey was relatively understood, we wanted to understand what the comparison with different teams were when we looked at different journey maps overlaid together. And more importantly, we wanted to be able to agree as a product team on which themes, and those are these black boxes across the top here, which, themes or problem spaces that we were identifying on behalf of our users that we wanted to go and put features against to solve those problems on. Now, the real great discussion that came from this is how do we decide which of these problem spaces gets which priority? And how do we take a very small problem that one might encounter in a flow down here and prioritize that into a feature that we might build uh, to make things easier for the user? So these kinds of questions start to come up when you generate results like this and generate research and knowledge of the users. The really important thing I want you to understand here is that we've organized this problem theme in a workflow related order. So this actual journey map represents, as many journey maps do, a time from point A to point B uh, in the user journey. And that, I argue, is the discovery that led me to understand after connecting a lot of these dots in, in our organization that really what I was describing with these journey map themes were the product roadmap themes. And if we could just agree on that, and if we could get the language of what those themes were and what they attended to and how they were scoped and what technology from all these different buckets in our organization drove those different components, we would be onto something and we could use this artifact, this visual artifact and the research data that we collected for it to generate more insights about what to do. And that's exactly what we want to do from journey maps. We don't want to spend a lot of time. I've, I've come to appreciate over my use of them uh, over the years that the lighter I spend curating the journey map and making the journey map a, a, a product itself, um, the more I'm wasting my time sort of, you know, polishing the stone. Uh, really what I want to use journey maps for is to understand a particular journey in the context of a particular discovery that I'm trying to do. And that might be against a, um, a feature that we have in our backlog that we want to pull out and say, let's solve this now. Let's come and, and you know, actually spend some time uh, doing that. But, you know, this is a, these are important artifacts to help orient the team, not only to the data, but also to the problem themes and the value of those themes that we're starting to look at. And that way, we're starting to answer questions like this, right? We're starting to see 
problems on the journey map that we encounter with users every day, real problems that we want to solve. If this is the design that we're putting out into the field and we see users using it in this inefficient way all the time, eventually this is going to come across as a major priority, especially when we see it across multiple clients. Uh, we'll start to prioritize this. And when we look at our journey map, we can start to see gaps in our service design and gaps in our feature set that don't solve problems. And that was very obvious to us using this particular approach in our research against one of our central uh, components here, making sense of the plan and the actual execution of the plan. And that central pivot there, we didn't have very many features on. And this journey map really shone the light on that in terms of here's the pain the users are having in the, pro in the field today, and here's how we're not solving them. So all of this comes to a grand quote. I'm sure a lot of you in the product space or working with product professionals are uh, you know, aware of this dynamic. Product professionals are very uh, ownership centric. These products are their babies. Oftentimes uh, developers and engineers can be very much like this too. Startups can be very much like this as well. Uh, there is a very big um, uh, tension around how many ideas you can generate through user research and how much time and money there is to build it. And the tension between growing that product backlog is always present and it really, um, it really needed for me to create, at least in our case at Acosta, one final visual artifact that helped uh, really drive home the process that I wanted to build that allowed us to translate the value that we were seeing from our design principles and our corporate goals into what we should be building into the roadmap. And that was really helping to answer this, you know, somewhat uh, uh, sarcastic question here, but it's literally trying to take those problem spaces and match the requests for ideas in those journeys to those problem spaces and to prioritize some uh, those somehow, have those conversations with the product teams. Um, it also helps us to avoid um, you know, some of the superfluous feedback that we always get from the field um, and some of the existing usability issues that we've somehow launched into our product that we need to fix, but somehow don't take on the uh, largest priority. You know, we'll, we'll take off either that cancel button or that close icon, either one. We'll do it someday, but not before we get our most uh, high priority feature in place. Um, this is always a tension with product teams. And once again, is another reason we want to curate our feedback and identify um, you know, a, a proper process to begin to do this. And this has led to perhaps my most glorious complex diagram of the year award uh, nomination. Um, but I have to tell you in putting this together and connecting the dots and in showing a modified version of this uh, to my product and engineering team, this really cemented what uh, UX design and product design could do strategically as a designer of one competency buried deep within an enterprise to try and bring the best feedback forward and put the best features into play um, with enough rationale that we could push back at the clients. And you know, even when we promise them uh, X, Y, and Z in a certain release and then can't deliver that for whatever reason, have you all been there yet? Uh, I certainly have. Um, Though these kind of diagrams and this kind of rationale helps us um, uh, have a process and have the reasons in the in the back pocket to not only generate a roadmap, but generate a roadmap with rationale that shows senior stakeholders what we mean and, and what our priorities are. This diagram really just shows um, all kinds of feedback channels and uh, the, the different, um, uh, you know, I mentioned survey feedback. I mentioned uh, uh, observations in the field. I mentioned senior client um, you know, recommendations about what they wanted to see change before they move into the product. All of these different uh, types of feedback come in in this large hopper at the top of the diagram. And ultimately, um, through this research process, I, through this discovery process and my journey maps, I was adding a lot of very focused feedback and a lot of, um, you know, in some case, focused ideas to our product backlog. One of the ways that we helped filter through those and turn those into real nuggets of opportunity, low hanging fruit, if you will, were to put them through a scoring mechanism. And you can see the, the problem themes that we have here down in the bottom of the diagram. We're really trying to solve these five problems, right? Um, you know, uh, weekly planning, 
preparing the visit and, and store scheduling, uh, sense making on the floor once you get to the store, um, uh, executing your tasks, and then uh, concluding the visit and providing visit analysis. Those five problem spaces, all of this feedback, everything that we are going to do is going to orient to one of those problems. If it doesn't, it might fall outside of what we currently see as our roadmap problem theme. Doesn't mean it's a bad idea, but it means that it's related to something that's beyond the scope of what this weekly workflow in our app does. And I think that helped really explain how we could take a lot of feedback and through a uh, this, this gray box in the middle represents a ceremony that engineering product and UX led by UX would lead saying, here's all the feedback, here's um, the, the categorizations and the prioritizations of that feedback, and here's the ideas connected to the clients that we've talked to. Based on that, what, um, what ideas do you wanna take forward? And that came up with the idea of taking these ideas and polishing them into highly curated ideas that put them through a scoring mechanism. That scoring mechanism was something that we had to agree upon. That was part of the process to help develop with uh, the, uh, with the uh, product team was what was important and why was it important. So it involved some ranking talks and product prioritization algorithms and that sort of thing. Uh, but it was a really great discussion to get us to a very simple algorithm about how we would choose the most, you know, the 10 easiest things to do. And then once we have those ideas, it's very easy to sort of pass those through those problem theme filters into what become roadmap feature set areas. And this is the language uh, from before on my slide before. You notice I'm using the same colors here in order to communicate those same sorts of um, uh, levels of ownership. The product people are, are the people that take over the roadmap and they're the ones that own the decision making on the roadmap. My UX roadmap has been giving them the landscape of the user environment, the landscape of user experience, so that they can decide which ones are the most important to choose. And I helped uh, them derive the, that algorithm to drive this, but ultimately it's their decision about how much uh, or how many features we decide to put into the backlog or we decide to release as an, uh, a minimum viable product or a minimum lovable product, as I like to call them. Um, and ultimately um, what, this, what this does is this shows us how using experience visioning we can create a sunny day scenario that this roadmap ultimately drives towards to solve user outcomes, to solve user problems that we understand by talking to users with research. So when they come to us with a problem, those problems on the bottom are ultimately the ones that get the users the, the winner's medal or the best uh, service medal or the uh, knowledge that they're not doing very good and they need to pull up their task execution, uh, that kind of feedback, right? So all of these things have value and all of that value can be connected back through a roadmap plan that maps back to problem themes, that maps back to value, that maps back to feedback that you receive about your product. And hopefully, uh, I won't spend too much time, but as you can see, uh, that, that problem space um, wrapped up by our Engage app, that's what we call our app is the Engage app, um, that actually as a service uh, sits in a much larger life cycle where we do client onboarding, where we do access management configuration setup for our tool based on our client requirements. And then there's support uh, that we offer uh, to our reps in real time that isn't part of the app itself, but kind of crosses over into it. And also the audit that is done that helps inform the analytics dashboard that our clients look at and that helps inform their weekly planning for the next week. So you can see as you go down this problem space, that you're connecting to a larger set of problems that ultimately drive up to a hierarchy, a North Star of your corporate capabilities. And in between, um, you can see some layers that we at Acosta have had to deal with in terms of the way we have done our corporate strategy. We have innovation programs that take on certain domains and, and cert, uh, seek to solve certain problems. Some of those problems are related to the ones that we actually deal with and engage. And so they are related at a high level, but you know, not always. Uh, but you can begin to see how this architecture, this information architecture of problems is essentially a, um, a product roadmap that rolls, that rolls up into a service design roadmap that can just become larger and larger. And you can overlay that with products and feature sets and map those by uh, priority. But that's kind of where uh, uh, my roadmapping experience has taken me um, in terms of being able to use visual artifacts to create UX roadmaps 
and really drive that relationship between engineering, product management, and UX design so that UX design and product design has a seat at the strategic table. And that's all I had for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed that story. Um, certainly welcome questions and clarifications and uh, uh, chats and commiserations with you after, but uh, that is all I have for now. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Gu. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the, in the Q&A here, but uh, before we do that, um, I'll mention, and I think Alona put in the chat as well. So these are uh, shorter versions of full talks. And if uh, you, know, you like what you hear, you want more details, uh, you can go to the links that Alona uh, provided to recordings of these uh, previous full talks. And I think our, our speakers did a great job about hitting some of the high, high points of their talk, but there's kind of more detail there. Um, and I, I think that we've proven the, the fact that it is impossible to put three talks into an hour, no matter how know. much you squeeze yes. them. Yes, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> good. It is a and, real art uh, distilling an hour and a half into 20 minutes. And uh, <laughs> that was great. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at the question. I think you've pretty much covered them. One is, uh, can you give me more details? So I would say, yeah, uh, uh, I would point so people So I think today, we have, uh, uh, Paul, we have two yeah. minutes left to the end of the session. So what yeah. do you think is the best use of our, our time? Yes. Um, uh, uh, well, I'll just, uh, if, if, uh, I'll ask if people have any questions for either of our presenters, I think that'd be the, be the best use. Uh, as far as I know, we can stick around after the session ends if people wanted to stick around and, That's and true. chat, yes. we'll, we'll still be here. Um, but, and uh, what I wanted to say is uh, I put in the, the link to torkai.org and we have events and since we are virtual now everybody from all over the world is certainly welcome to join us and we have a monthly uh, event so please come and check us out check our youtube channel you can see some of the great talks we've had in the past and uh, that's what we have been doing for the past 30 years our organization's been doing this monthly for a very long time not the videos are not all there for the 30 years but we have quite a few of them and they're very, very detailed, insightful. And what we specialize in is the connection between academia and industry. I think we really walk that fine line, unlike some of the other organizations in our space that uh, we bring together that community from the two worlds. And I think we, we marry them pretty well together and grow both sides. So, sorry, Paul, I took that. No, that was great. I'm glad you were able to get a little uh, description of our what we do and how we do it and that sort of thing. And, you know, Alona is one of the uh, person who does a lot of our programming. She's done that for many years. So she goes out and finds presenters and uh, so happy, happy Tireless to Tireless champion, tireless That's champion right. on the Toronto scene. That's right. Good, good. Yes, we, we did try to do the impossible. So if anybody's confused, it was because we had the uh, three talks uh, squeeze into one, that was the plan. And clearly, it wasn't very clearly communicated. That's a UX problem. And, <laughs> and we will try to do better and more clearly, but we had to fit into the, the flow of the event and the, and the schedule. So thank you all for joining. I have no idea if anybody's out there, according to my interface, but hopefully there were some people. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, as you said, we, we can't really see how many people are here in the session and who has left. Um, but thank you, Andrew, for the very flowing uh, presentation. I, I really like the fact that uh, the, the answers from the audience were embedded into the slides. Well done. And, um, and thank you, Drew, for your very substantial uh, presentation. I, I got a lot from it. And I, I would like to, you know, have more time to digest it because it was quite uh, meaty. And um, and I, I really like your IA of problems, <laughs> really really lovely uh, information architecture of problems. So it's really. I and I see that I, I see there's a few questions in the Q and A for for Drew. Yes. I yes. don't see any questions for Andrew because he did such a great job answering any possible no questions. questions that required come there. Up. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Oh. I, I think uh, if if uh, you guys have time to stick out, so, so perhaps. Uh, Drew, you can uh, spend some time answering these questions. Um, otherwise, um, you know, people will have the tough decision to um, make a choice of staying or leaving. There is two yep. uh, sessions um, beginning in a few minutes. So right. one in Calgary, UX, and then one in Auckland, New Zealand. So 
um, if you want to make your way, then uh, you just press on the uh, you know the arrow on the top of that interface, and then you you can select the the right session that you want to attend. Um, but our speakers will will remain here to answer some questions uh, if we can. So uh, thank you very much. It was a really good uh, session, and I wish that everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to be ducking out for now. Take care. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks so much, Andrew. Bye. Bye, Andrew. Right. So, Drew, you uh, can you see the Q and A? Ah, uh, this is under the conversations tab. Q and A. Yes. Yes. Okay, I see it here. They are all for you. So maybe you go from I don't know if it's bottom up or top down. Yeah, I think it's bottom up. Bottom up. Yeah. Bottom up. Okay. What is a healthy relationship? But let's find out. Wait, before you do that, let's find out if these people are here, because if they're not here, uh, are we recording this part as well? Natalie, do you know? Yes, we are. OK. OK, so if we're recording, then he can answer them and then they can get them later. OK, then yeah, so this is from uh, Arthur Klepchikov. Is that right? Is Arthur yes, still Arthur here? is here. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, Arthur, do you want to uh, unmute and just uh, ask your question? Maybe give us a little more context for that? So Arthur, if you want to raise your hand and um, maybe I'll, uh, you know, I'll be able yeah, to- Yeah, if not, I mean, I, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a straight up question here. Um, so for me, when I started um, creating a UX roadmap, my roadmap, my plan uh, was really my plan about how to develop the UX practice at the place uh, that I was the manager for. And in developing that practice, I needed to show how I was going to um, use personas or develop personas to the point where they could be used um, when I was going to have a design system up, um, those, those things. And so for me, it was, it was the roadmap of how we would build UX capabilities to ultimately uh, you know, uh, serve the needs of the product and serve the needs of the, the team that we were forming at the time. So first and foremost, it became that. Um, it quickly turned into a conversation of, and, and I think this is where my product manager wanted to create conversations between UX and product and basically say, look, as a product manager, you have certain priorities, you, know, you answer to these certain analytics and these things, uh, you don't necessarily know what users are asking for or if that contradicts the priorities that you're trying to uh, trying to follow um, with, with your roadmap. So can we create a version of the roadmap, a UX version of the roadmap, where you, from a UX point of view, can show higher level versions of problems that we can solve faster versus ones that we would have to spend a little bit more time building, ones with a little bit more risk. And the two versions of those roadmaps became the conversation point where we could say, you know, if we just did this, or if we oriented to this user problem with a little bit more attention, um, we would get a lot more return. We would get a lot more notice. We'd get a better rating. We'd get more client satisfaction, whatever it was. Um, but those conversations between the product manager and the UX uh, researcher, UX design lead, um, were the real instrumental ones to help drive that uh that ultimate conversation of okay what is it that we're going to build and ultimately that like i said that that was their decision but it started to be influenced by me because i had a roadmap and because i could uh take the product manager's roadmap and redraw it with a certain priority uh priority give him a visual artifact back that we could have a conversation around and that's kind of where i think that relationship exists ultimately that should be one right it, it, and 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 the team should manage one version, uh, and there's lots of software out there that'll help you do that and help you, uh, you know, visualize different uh, uh, roadmap aspects like that. Does that make sense, Arthur? Is that? Uh... Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Great. Now perhaps we can take a question from um, um, Tarin. Tarin, would you like to be on stage? Karen, yeah. You explain your research process all the way to product, uh, conduct research, then affinity diagram for themes, then tick the themes. So this is a little bit, uh, this is a detailed uh, question. The, the answers I think are somewhat contained in the, um, in the longer version of this uh, talk. But I think what ultimately 
was the most important thing to understand was the five themes. And the real big insight for us was rather than starting the conversation, um, you know, uh, roadmap themes. So, so design principles and roadmap themes are very uh, interrelated in the sense that you want to deliver design principles to solve those problems. So in order to have uh, research connect to that, you have to kind of, th th that's why I thought the, the language between how we communicated those themes was very important because the themes and how we solved the problems talked about the level of how important that was to users. And once we could talk in those terms, um, that became our way of taking that, re that raw research and uh, shortlisting ideas that we could sort of pull off and put into a list and then build on that short list with other research that we heard or other channels of feedback that we had gathered to su support that argument. And ultimately, um, what we were trying to do from, um, from that research was gather enough priority points to move it up or down in that short list, if that makes sense. Now, from a research point of view, if you're asking how, how did we do the detailed research that gathered those journey maps, um, it was really a four session um, agenda. And, and this, this agenda can vary depending on how much time you have, depending on the people that you have in attendance, um, depending on the level of uh, maturity with the process they have, et cetera. Um, but generally we had four sessions. In the first session, we heard user research. We heard how users use existing tools like ours in the field or use our tools already um, or, or want to use tools like ours. And in the second session, we used journey mapping as visual note taking. So it was a way of communicating um, literally what we heard in process flow terms across those themes, across the different themes of, of how they used our tool in a week. Um, and by, by categorizing and chunking our research into those discrete chunks, we found that not only did we create an entire flow and a set of categories that mapped up to those problem themes, we also created um, what could be a detailed series of use cases which we could dive into. And if we wanted to you know, blow out a, a process like, like uh, the, the weekly planning meeting where they look at the dashboards, we didn't have an idea of what those interfaces look like. Um, we didn't need to know them in the journey map that we did, but if we wanted to know them, we could go back and do another journey map just about that specific part. And that starts to get at that hierarchy, right? That journey map is, is way more than just a sequential journey through your product. It's a 3D interrelated journey across and back and forth and, and, and through. And it's not just as easily summarized. And I think one of the biggest insights was how we could use those artifacts to map all these real world um, uh, design and feedback uh, snippets into something that we could actually use and that would art augment our discussion around how we prioritize building products. Awesome. Does, does that answer your question? Um, I think so. So what I think I'm hearing you say is you basically did interviews with users to understand how they were using your product over a week of time in a particular area of the journey. And then you map that on to a journey map but as you were mapping that, you also gathered other insights that related to other parts of the journey map that you knew you could go back and do more research on if it became- Dig deeper in, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then for the prioritization piece of it, you were ranking things in some sort of way. Can you talk a little bit about prioritizing? Because I think that's a big- Yeah, big that, that's- a lot of Yes, and you know what, uh, your your question actually mirrors some of the confusion that we had. That was a, literally a learning in my process was I took it for granted that by the time I, you know, came uh, and uh, came to the ceremony with all of the, uh, the, um, the ideas that we would gather over and be able to easily agree on a scoring mechanism to do this. And that turned out to be a real problem where, you know, people couldn't agree on the priorities, much less uh, agree, well, they were agreeing on the problem. So um, just one clarification to your point, the journey map that we constructed was the journey map of the entire journey of a user using our, our software in a week. Uh, there's no other reason to use our software other than that weekly cycle. So the journey map was our complete um, problem space of all the problems, whether they had, whether software, uh, 
had features for the user to use or not. This was the problem space that the users were in. They just happened to have a tool to use here and there through that space. And we wanted to understand where we could broaden out deploying a feature into a gap that we found in that journey map, or whether we could prioritize an existing problem because it was so core to what we did. So I'll give you an example of that. One of the core things that we do is measure uh, the number of tasks that, uh, that a rep does when they go into a store. So it's very important for a rep to get through all of their tasks and complete them. But if they can't do that, they have to do them in an order that provides the maximum value. And so the tool's job is to show them which ones are the most valuable ones so that if they don't have enough time, they can at least get the best bang for the buck for their visit there. And I think when you have, um, you know, uh, um, scoring and, and, and specific outcomes that are present in that journey, when you have very clear uh, UX outcomes that are the sunny day scenario, you know, we have to complete all of our goals or all of our tasks. That's the sunny day scenario. If you don't do that, it's not a sunny day. So it's very easy to say using that journey map and using those sun, those sun points on the, on those journeys, that's the first point where you begin to hear straight from the user's mouths, what they value in that. Now to bring that value system into the product discussion, we have to create an algorithm, like I say, and I think the easiest one for teams to use would be value versus effort. How much value does it take, or how much value will it uh, bring to our users versus how much effort will it take to build? Those two relatively simple things to come up with, tongue in cheek there, um, th those are not so easy to come up with, but if you can agree on those two measures, then that equation of value times effort produces a number that you can rank and, and create a score from. There are other scoring models that other software that I've used have exposed, such as uh, business risk, such as resource costs, such, uh, such as um, um, usability gains achieved, um, efficiency gains achieved. And, and, and by ticking boxes like that, you add to the algorithm of value that if the feature checks those boxes, they increase in their score and make the top 10 cutoff. Does that explain somewhat, uh, you know, how we derive those values? I, I know it doesn't sort of give you the easy answer about how to actually get them, but that's what's no, that, needed. No, that's that totally, cool. yeah, that's really helpful. That explains it a lot. And I think that um, the only the only struggle we probably have is that like all of our PMs are on different products. And so they understand the complexity of each of their own products and our UX team spans products. And so it's easier for us to have like a holistic view and rank those things, but it. Well, and, for and therein, the I think lies, to actually yeah. make the prioritization. Yeah, th therein lies the opportunity. I think that with that hierarchy of problems, right? So, if you think about that hierarchy of problems, we have one set of problems which our product maps to, and we get that. If we can agree with that other product team that you know you somehow roll up to your uh, up to our north star in your way. So we have a we have another neighboring product team in our organization, which is the uh, data and analytics group, and arguably they are a product group, but I would I would say that they are more uh, data engineers, data analysts, um, and dashboard builders than they are product people building products. Yet they are still called product people within our organization, and our models of how we build a product in Engage and how they build a product in Dashboard Land is very different in terms of the process. But in terms of the way that they would consume and use those insights, they would be the same. They, they, they would be, the prioritization would be to build a certain feature and they could just build it a, you know, a, in dashboard land, they could build it a lot more uh, lean and, and sort of uh, prototype in, in real time. Whereas we have to put a lot more, um, you know, prototyping in and, and wireframing and traditional design, um, you know, which, which is a different process. So it's the same kind of data driving the same kinds of conversations but a different process to execute on, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, but therein lies, you know, the job of an overarching design lead or a portfolio design lead or a director of user experience or something like that. Their job is to unite the portfolio and those different products and make sure that all the products are pointing to, you know, their own North Stars and that all those North Stars are pointing to the, the larger North Stars. So does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes lots of sense. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, 
I think there was just, uh, yeah, there's just one more question there just on the sharing of the PowerPoint. I think we'll, we'll do that um, after the presentation, but yeah, that's- I have, uh, uh, I have pointed everybody to your, uh, to your longer talk and the slides Oh my there, gosh, so. not for the faint of heart, but yes, yeah, we'll get this, uh, <laughs> we'll get the more uh, brief one up uh, under the, uh, under our broadcast here, so. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming. I think we are uh, good to end this session. Thank you. There's still some Thanks bodies out people. there. Thank you for your thank you. Thank you. Over and out from Toronto. Take care, guys. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Bye from Australia. <laughs>